it's our hope that when we adopt the new life in Christ, is that we exhibit Christ living in us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would show the world what Christ is like. And of course, that would be our ideal. But it doesn't always happen that way. So today's message is under new and better management. And we hope to uh, see what that means for our life. Now about, oh golly, it's going over 30 years ago now. I can't remember how long ago it was. But when I was in grade 5, I was in Mrs. Thompson's class at Peace Memorial School in Hamilton. And uh, lo and behold, one day this new fella came into the class. His name was George. George Capinius, I think, was his name. And he and his family had just moved to Canada from Yugoslavia. And... George didn't have a great command of the English language at the time, and, you know, it was a new culture. You know, I think it's honest to say that he would have been very comfortable being back in Yugoslavia and speaking his mother tongue. But, you know, he tried. He was in a a new world, okay? He had taken out of his old world, put into a new world, and he did struggle and struggle to try to do the the Canadian thing. Now, it happened one day... uh, we were doing the metric system. That's when Canada was really pushing the metric system. And we had this uh, uh, little workshop we had to do. We had to go down to the gymnasium, and we had a basketball court. And our uh, little task was to find out how many times we'd have to go around the basketball court to equal a kilometer. And we had this stick with a wheel on it, and it would click every time you walked a meter. And so we decided between the group of us that we'd each count off a, a hundred meters and we give it to someone else. So we all started. And when it came to George's turn, uh, he took the stick and, and we were kind of rushing this because we wanted to get it done. And he was having a hard time to count in English. Okay? So what do you think he did after he got frustrated? He counted in Yugoslavian, of course. <laughs> right? Because when it, when it came to a tough situation and he couldn't cope with the new life, What did he do? He just went back to where he was comfortable, right? And I use this as an example because I think many times as us as Christians, the Bible tells us, as we looked at last week, that we are to reckon that we are a new creature. But many times in our life, when situations aren't favorable, you know, sometimes when life catches you by surprise, we react. And how do we react? Do we react in the new life? Often it's in the old way, right? The Bible says that we were taken from the old nature, that that old nature has been dealt with. It is rendered dead, it's crucified, and we live in a new resurrection life. You know, you think about it. uh, Perhaps you did a beautiful floral arrangement, or uh, you wrote a beautiful poem, and someone comes up and says, that stinks. Who did that? What's your first reaction? That's right. Eh? Your blood pressure goes up and you're thinking, kill, right? That's the old nature. That's not the new nature. Okay, so this is a problem that uh, Christians today all over the world deal with. And it was, not all, it was also a, a problem that the church at Rome had, as well as the other churches as well. So Paul's writing this passage to help the believer deal with this struggle. And, the, and also chapter 7 of Romans illuminates this problem as well. Okay? Now, let's read the passage. I'm going to start at chapter or chapter 7. I'm going to start at verse 14, because I think it ties together. Okay, so you can read along with me if you'd like. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms, because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, 
So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I want to start off with this one question. I yeah, see so you're giggling at the picture. I'll explain that in the middle, in a minute. Verses 14 to 15. Let's address this first because I think it's a problem that many Christians deal with. I know for a long time I dealt with this problem and this confusion. And I must confess, as Paul says, I must speak in human terms because, you know, I think it would be pretty arrogant of me to say I got this completely figured out. Okay? But we're talking with a problem here. Not only were the believers at Rome dealing with the issue of feeling comfort in the old nature and trying to strive to fit into the new, there was also this uh, confusing matter of law. Because at the church, there were those who were saying, no, 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 we've got to keep some of the old legalistic rituals. We've got to obey the law. And if you remember over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the fact that we have been justified, we are righteous by faith, apart from the law, apart from works. But still there was this, uh, this lingering confusion. So what does he say? For we shall not, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And so having said that, you can see where there might have been an accusation against Paul where they might have said, well, this Paul and the message he preaches, he says it's all grace, 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 and no law. Therefore, we can do whatever we want because there's no more law. There's no more law to tell us what we can and can't do. But Paul is trying to assure the believers that no, this is not the case. And so, understanding what the error was, someone might be tempted to say, well, if there's no law, is this party time? That's why I put a party animal up here, right? Okay. We have to understand that what Paul is trying to say to this church at Rome. We looked at the fact that the law was prescribed to a nation, Israel, who was under a covenant with God. And the law was used to illuminate to those people what sin was. And with the law... A person who is living in a covenant relationship with God measures his life up with what the law says and he is condemned that he is a sinner. And then he has to go before God and say, God, I have sinned. And there's a prescribed remedy. As you see here in Romans 3 and 20, as Paul has already uh, covered, he says, For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Okay? But what Paul is trying to say is, as a new risen creation that is powered by the Holy Spirit, that entity of you as a Christian who is in Christ, the law has no part on that. Because the law brings you to Christ. It makes you realize you're a sinner. It makes you realize that you have a problem that you can't fix. When you come to the point where you accept God's good news that your sins have been dealt with, that you have a power to be delivered from the power of sin, you are in Christ. You're no longer in Adam's nature. You're in Christ. You are a new creation. And so this is the grace. This is what faith gives us. And therefore, that is where we are. We don't have to worry about law anymore in that sense. And therefore, it doesn't mean we can do whatever we want. As Paul goes on to describe, we are a slave to our new master. The new master is God in his righteousness. The former master was sin. Okay? Okay. Now, 
There's a few terms here I want to talk about I think we have to deal with in our culture because uh, they're kind of awkward terms in our culture today. The two terms that Paul uses, and for, for good reason he uses these terms, but for us they're a little bit awkward, they are obedience and slavery. Okay. Now why do I say these things? Well, in our culture... We don't like that term obedience, do we? Right? You know, a lot of people gag on that word. You go up to someone and tell them, look, you've got to obey me. Oh, yeah? You don't have any right to tell me what to do. Right? That's our culture. We've grown in, up in that. You know, even for our children, there's child advocates out there that uh, are really down on you if you think that you should somehow forcibly get your children to obey you. You know, because they think that that's oppressive and it's an affront to their dignity. You know, these are some of the words they use. I don't know if you've noticed this. I've noticed this. Uh, I see a lot of dog training schools these days. I don't see many dog obedience schools anymore. Have you noticed that? Right? Same thing. We don't oppress these poor animals, right? They're just earth cohabitants like the rest of us. Okay? And this idea of obedience often gets mixed in with this idea of oppression. And our society and our free democratic society, you know, we've, we think we've moved away from a time when we had evil dictators and tyrants, many of who have forced obedience from defenseless people. And to a large degree, that is why our society kind of revolts at this term of obedience. You know, in the Bible, it talks about uh, wives, obey your husbands in everything, Right? A lot of women don't like that. But if you understand the true sense of the word, it's not offensive. Okay? Even for us as Canadians today, you know, we, are, we have our troops over in Afghanistan fighting a group called the Taliban. And people I know in the military tell me what the Taliban are like. They are oppressors. They are brutes. They will go into a town and gather up the men and force them to be obedient, to go into the field to fight their battles under the threat that they will kill their families if they don't obey. So we can understand why our society doesn't like this particular term. Now, if we understand the simple roots of this word obedience, it comes from two words. Essentially, it means under and to hear. And so this word obedience really, in its simplest form, simply has the sense of receiving instruction. That's all. Okay? I could go at home and I can say to one of my kids, you know, you can really help me out today. Uh, we need to cut the grass. You want to do that? Okay, they say. Okay, then I'll... <laughs> Some people are chuckling. Anyway, so I say, well, look, you're using a gas lawnmower. You've got to be careful. Here's how you load the gas. Don't spill it. Here's how you start it. Watch your toes. Don't stick your hand in. Blah, blah, blah. Now, if the child is sitting there taking this all in with the attitude that, yes, I will do this, the child's obedient. Isn't that great? Simple as that. I didn't have to hold a hockey stick over her head. I didn't have to put her in a headlock until she did it. Just simple obedience. Okay? Now, the idea of this obedience, unlike what you might have under a dictator or a tyrant, the sense of obedience that Paul is talking about is an obedience that is given freely. Okay? Unlike the picture here, this is a, a sand structure that was called oppression. And often we think of obedience sometimes in the negative context. You know, you've got someone oppressing some poor person and they're helpless and they have no choice but to obey. That is not what Paul is talking about here. This is a free choice, this obedience. It's an active choice. You know, last week when Mark looked at uh, the fact that we are instruments of either sin or of righteousness, in, in a sense, it's kind of a passive thing. You know, if we yield to it, God can use us or sin could use us as an instrument, just like an, a musician might pick up a saxophone and play it. But when it comes to obedi obedience and listening or taking instruction from a master, that is something we choose to do. In this case, we have a choice. Okay, and we'll look at that in a bit. 
Now, the other issue I wanted to talk on was slavery. Because Paul uses this uh, picture of slaves in this passage. There's a few things we've got to understand about being a slave. It's a concept we're not that familiar with anymore. And we think of it as being pretty harsh. But you've got to remember that if you are a slave, you are property more than you are a person. Okay? Your life is not your own. You are owned. Almost in the same sense, whether you, if you have a car and a slave, to the one who owns them, they're the same. And with that slave, I can buy them or I can sell them. In the earliest days, many slaves were acquired through uh, military conquest. For example, if a, a nation moved in on a city and plundered it, they would usually kill all the men because they can fight back, right? We, the enemy doesn't want to have, that, to have to deal with that again. And what they would often do is the women and the children, they would take them captive and make them into slaves. And we think, that's horrible. How dare those people take those poor, defenseless people away from their homes and their families and do such things? But you know, I never realized this before as I read in a historical document. The people who were conquering actually saw this as a humane thing. The other alternative was to slaughter them. Okay? Just give you something to think about. The other thing that's interesting about slaves is that if you had children, if you were a slave, if you had children, those children are not yours. They're the masters. So if you were freed, the children are still the masters. I found that a, a, an interesting concept because we often look at sin as being a master to us. And we look at our great ancestor, Adam. And Adam became bound under sin. And we are his children, in a sense, aren't we? And when we are born into this world, and because our father, Adam, was bound to sin, we are too. Isn't that a neat picture? That's why the Bible uses that example. Now, at the time Paul wrote this letter to the church at Rome, Slavery had been around for thousands of years. It was a worldwide phenomenon. And Rome was full of them. You know, it's estimated that as up to as many as 90% of the population of Rome were slaves or freed slaves, and the other ones owned slaves. And it's very likely that the majority of people in the church that Paul was writing to were probably slaves themselves. So Paul is using... Uh, an illustration that would be very close to their knowledge and their experience as slaves. Okay? Now, being a slave was always not a bad thing. In the Roman times, many slaves uh, were looked after very well because there was laws and so forth. People often volunteered to be slaves if they owed money, if they were in debt. You know, in, in times of recession in Rome, sometimes it was better off to be a slave because there was government rules about how a slave should live. And if you were your own businessman and you were having hard times with your business, many times the slaves would be looked after better than you would. Okay? There's also an Old Testament example here I thought was interesting. It says, It shall come about if he says to you, talk about the slave, I will not go from you because he loves you and your household, since he fares well with you. Then you shall take an awl and pierce it through his ear. I know this sounds kind of horrid, but you know they didn't have ear-piercing guns then. Okay, so this is the best they could do. And so they would be marked as being a servant. Okay, and so I say this just to get around our cultural barriers that you know this, this issue of being a slave in biblical sense is not a bad thing. Did you ever notice that in the New Testament... It neither condones nor approves of slavery. It just simply acknowledges that it existed. And Paul even himself gave exhortation. Do you, ho do you own slaves? Treat them well. Are you a slave? Obey your master. Okay? Okay, now. Last week, our brother Mark looked at uh, some of the truths that we are to know about 
We are to know. We are to know that God, what God has done for us. Okay, our sin has been dealt with, and we have been resurrected in His resurrection. And the word that was used was reckon it to be true. You may not see it, you may not feel it, but this is fact. So just know that it is true. Do you trust in the work of Christ on the cross? Then your sin has been dealt with. You've been, you've been, uh, your guilt has been dealt with. And you are a new creature risen in Christ. That's a fact. Okay, so reckon it to be true. And the encouragement last week was to present yourselves to God as instruments of righteousness. Okay, so today, we're going to look at this choice that Paul encourages. This choice. He says, we are slaves. We are slaves. And there are really only two masters out there. The one is righteousness. Anything else is sin as a master. And if you are a slave, you are owned by that master. And you, are, you have to obey them. That's just the way it is of being the slave. So we have a choice as a believer. Okay, Either you obey sin or you obey righteousness. We have a choice. Even as a believer. And at the end I want to get to this to describe this because as Christians we're almost kind of a, a dual character in a sense. Just as I explained with George, right? A lot of times we know that, yes, I'm a new being. I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me. Then why so often do I act in the old nature? Okay, this is just a, a, a fact of reality. Now, unfortunately, sin is a cruel master. You know, sin and the law, the law just points out that you're a sinner. And you're a sinner and a sinner. Okay, but the problem with sin in itself is that when you sin once, you notice that sometimes the second sin, to do the sin over and over again, it gets easier and easier and easier to do it. Okay, consider, we have a thing called a conscience. And many have suggested that the, the conscience, even Paul suggested this, is that the conscience is God's law written on our heart. And when we're in a situation where we have a choice to sin, you know, that conscience kind of makes some noise and says, I wouldn't do that. Okay? Some have also said that it's almost like having the voice of God inside of us, telling us not to do something. But unfortunately, if we learn to ignore that voice, you'll find out that the second time you do it, it's easier to ignore that voice. Same with the third time and the fourth time. And eventually, it doesn't bother you at all. I like to think of it this way. You're in a place, and the opportunity to sin is before you. And just over here is God speaking to you, saying, I wouldn't do that. And you ignore him. And what you do is you kind of walk away from him. And the opportunity presents itself again. This time God's a little further away and it's easier to ignore him. So you ignore him again. And again. And again. And what has happened? As each time I ignore God, I get further away from him and his voice becomes more quiet. And if you remember a few uh, months ago, we looked at a passage in the beginning of Romans where it tells us how God deals with those that are unrighteous. He says that God gets to a point when there is someone so bent on doing, indulging themselves in lust and sin that God, remember the word, gives them over to their lusts and passions. And it's almost this picture that once you get so far from God, God says to you, you want to do this? Fine, go. I won't stop you. And you have this separation from God. And the unfortunate thing is, if nothing is done to reconcile this difference, this distance between you and God by the time you physically die, that distance is permanent. Okay? God will give you what you want. If you want nothing to do with Him in life, 
when it comes to the afterlife, you say, that's what you wanted. You know, in a lot of ways, I, I, I see that God never really condemns someone to hell. God only gives people what they ask for. It's what they wanted. Didn't want a life with God, so that's what they will end up with. You know, in comparison, righteousness is becoming more holy. It's, the, it's almost a stepping of moving the other way. It's moving closer and closer to God. As you come closer to God and obey Him, He empowers you to become more like Him. And it moves the other way. And the benefit of serving that Master is that in the end you have a life that's abundant and eternal. And it's powered by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, how do we deal with this in a, in a practical sense? You know, for the Romans that were struggling with this problem of the law and sin and how to fit grace into this, you see, the problem with this is, is if you are working in a system that talks about law, which points to sin, and you're looking back to the law to try to figure out how to get away from the sin, but it keeps pointing you back at the sin, what are you looking at all the time? You just see the sin. It's just sin, 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 and it's hard to break out of this trap. Okay? Paul even says that when you were a slave to sin in your former life, you had no obligation to righteousness whatsoever. It's because you really couldn't. Because you had a master called sin who didn't even want you to look at righteousness. And he kept you busy doing his own thing. The sin thing. Now, let's try to put it in another way about where this problem leads to. About not focusing on, on the law, which points to sin. Okay, there's our next picture here. Where's our next picture? There it is. Okay, here I have a picture of an elephant. This is a, a neat little example I picked up from a fellow named Charlie Price, who's a, a preacher in Toronto. This was so good I had to use it. Okay, here we have a picture of an elephant in the savanna. And there's a nice big tree. So you can see this elephant, right? It's a nice big African elephant. He's got tusks and a great big trunk. And he's up into this tree. Now I want you to picture this elephant, say, perhaps picking leaves from the tree and so forth. You get this in your mind. Even if I shut this picture off, you'd have this picture of this elephant in your mind. Okay? Now, even looking at the screen or just in your mind, try to get rid of the elephant. Don't think of an elephant. Stop thinking of the elephant. It's hard to do, isn't it? Here, let me, let me give you a hand here. Okay, think of that tree. Have you gotten rid of the elephant yet? Don't think of the elephant. Okay? Okay, let, let, let me give you a break. I want you to think of lions. Okay? You can see that savanna. And there's these lions all kind of laying around. They're just basking in the warm orange sunlight. You can see their golden eyes looking back at you and they're flicking their tail with a little black tuft of hair on the end of the tail and their mane blowing in the breeze. Have you got rid of the image of the elephant now? Well, some people say no. But for most people, when you flood your mind again with the image of the, elef or the, of the lion, you should have forgotten about the elephant. Okay? Now, this is the point I'm trying to get across to you. Is if you are living in a spiritual system where you're constantly trying to stop sinning by following the law... All it does is it keeps pointing you to sin. You can't get it out of your mind. What Paul is trying to get the believer to do is stop looking to the old master of sin and look to the new master of righteousness. What's he saying? He says, get your mind off that thing because you don't belong there anymore. You are a spiritual creature. You are a slave to righteousness. Let's look at a couple of passages that actually talk about this. Where are we here? Oops. There we are. Philippians 4 and 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good of good repute, if there is any excellence, if, if, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So if you dwell on those things, you've got your mind off the sin. 
Same thing with Philippians uh, 3 and 20. It's the whole idea of turn our eyes on to Christ, not to where we've been. Let's look to Christ. Remember last week in our opening, we sang, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And we used the example of, of driving a car. And it's often said that if you want to keep the car on the road, you look down the road. As soon as you got your eyes in the ditch, that's, where you're, that's probably where you're going to end up. Okay? So here's this idea. There's one more I saw this morning, which I really thought was good. It says, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on these things above, not on the things on earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There's another passage in the New Testament same theme, okay? Now, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time here. But there's this issue that is talked about. We talked about sin and, and how we're to get away from that. What Paul is encouraging the believer to do is to have obedience to righteousness in order to have sanctification. Some of your passages might say. Other, other uh, books might say holiness, Correct? Okay, the, the word I'm using is uh, sanctification in this case. And so we have these two things, sanctification and death. I want to talk about death briefly for a second. Death in the Hebrew mind is separation. It is separation from God. If I just sneak ahead here. There it is. When God said this, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the, in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Okay? When he said that, what he was implying is that you don't trust me and our relationship will be severed. You will be separated from me, is what God meant. Death in Hebrew means separation. And it eventually ends up that you will be separated from your body. You will be separated from the world. That's the context of separation. But you know what's interesting is that the word sanctification or holiness also implies separation. Okay? It means to be set apart, taken away, set aside, usually with the implication of having a special use. Now, to us as believers and knowing the Word of God, sanctification is often used as a picture of something or someone being separated from the world and set aside unto God's purpose. Okay? So I found that a very interesting picture that both death and sanctification or holiness imply separation. On the one case, we have death which separates the, uh, the created entity from its spiritual source, death, and we have sanctification, which separates the sinner from his natural world and sets him aside unto God. It's an interesting, interesting picture. Okay, before I get to that picture. We have to be obedient to one or the other. You know, in this world, especially in our culture, we have so many choices. Okay? What to wear, what kind of car you drive, what kind of church you come to. You have choices for lunch. You can go home. There's all kinds of restaurants out there. You've got a freezer full of different types of food. You have choices on your education. You have choices on your uh, philosophy uh, and what kind of job you want. But when it comes down to a life and death issue, what Paul is implying here is heh, there's only two choices. You serve sin or you serve righteousness. There is no other. The one leads on to death. The other one leads on to eternal life. There is no difference. Or there is no other choice. Okay? Now, I'm trying to explain this. And so I, I brought up this... Uh, chart to see if I can ex help explain this. <clears throat> now, on the left here, we have the old nature. 
Remember I said that if a slave has a child born under his master, that child belongs to that master? We are born of Adam's race. Therefore, we are born on this planet enslaved to sin. Can't help it. You can try all you want to try to break out of it. You don't have the power because your master will not let you. Okay? And that side of this chart here, because of sin, leads to death. That's why Paul says the wages of sin is death. Okay? But you know, if you're blessed to hear and comprehend and accept the gospel of God, that Jesus Christ came to this world to pay that sin debt for the sinner, that they don't have to go to eternal separation from God, but can be made a new creation. It brings us over to the right side of the cross, in this case. And what the Bible is telling us to account as being absolutely true, except this fact, is that our sins have been dealt with and have been paid for, and we are a new creation, powered by the Holy Spirit, and set aside unto God for eternity. That's a fact. Okay? What Paul is talking about in this letter, and he continues on in chapter 7 to deal with this issue, is that we find out that there is actually two natures in us. Still. The Bible tells us that this old nature, which has been carried over from the old in a sense, still resides in this body. Okay? My body's still sin-cursed, isn't it? It's going to die. This body isn't going to live forever. And this body is still prone to uh, some of the sensitivities of the old nature. But I do have within me a new creation. It's spiritual. It's not worldly. It is not powered by the old nature. It is powered by the Holy Spirit. And what Paul is saying, which one do you as a Christian do you obey? Right? Which one do you heed to? Okay? There is only two masters in your life as a Christian. And it's either you obey sin or you obey righteousness. And I think in a reality, as we discussed with my friend George, right, as we live this life, we're to account the one thing as being true. In George's case, he says, I'm a Canadian. For us as a Christian, say, I'm a Christian. But we often find that depending on the situation, we find it easy to go back to the old nature and obey it. So the only thing I can suggest is, is do what the Bible tells us to do. As in you know, the case of the elephant in the tree. <laughs> Stop looking at that old nature. We are encouraged to obey righteousness. So let's look towards the Master. Let's think of the Master. Okay? The Master being righteousness. And when we follow Him then He will lead us. And, the, and the, the more lessons we learn about how to become more and more like Him, He will give us new lessons. And the Holy Spirit will continue to empower us to keep moving towards Him. You know, sanctification happens in three ways. First of all, it's positional. As that chart showed, as the Bible tells us, consider the fact that you are set apart unto God. That's positional. There is a progression Day by day, as we walk in the Lord, the old nature of us should be pushed aside bit by bit as the Holy Spirit comes into our life and takes up more space. The real good news, and this is the day I'm looking forward to, is that there will be an eternal sense of this sanctification. That when I shed this body, I will be permanently, forever delivered from the presence of sin. And I will be a new creation, as we read in, in Colossians, says that when our Lord is revealed, we will be revealed with Him also. These are great, great words. Okay? Heavenly Father, we give You thanks for Your Word to us. And Lord, this is a very convicting passage because we acknowledge that although we know what You have done for us, Father, we find ourselves continually living by our own 
nature, our old nature, by our instincts. And Father, Your Word tells us that we don't have to. We don't have to live and obey the old master of sin any longer. But Father, we also realize, as Paul's put it here, is that it's our choice. It's really our choice which master we choose to listen to and to obey. And Father, we also recognize that a lot of it is in the sense of where we look. Father, it's so easy to look onto our world and into our own situation and we get caught up in the old ways of how the world operates. And there we find ourselves operating the world's way. But Father, help us to be encouraged to look as your word encourages, encourages us to do is to look unto our Savior, to look unto things that are righteous and holy and good. And Father, we, we know that you will give us the power through the Holy Spirit to do these things because your word says that it is so. Father, we thank you for your ever presence with us and your faithfulness, knowing that you will work out in us what you have planned for us. For this we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.